Recording. This meeting is being recorded. All righty. Um, welcome everyone to um, a PSG and PGSG Immigration Attorney General Informational Session for the spring uh, 2022 semester. As a reminder, this initiative was developed to increase access to immigration legal services by offering monthly virtual services free to both undergraduate and graduate students at Purdue University. Additionally, like I said, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Purdue Student Government YouTube page to be referenced in the future. This is, this is a joint initiative between Purdue Graduate Student Government and Purdue Student Government. And we'd like to give a special thank you to Purdue Student Legal Services, the Office of International Students and Scholars, uh, the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship, and of course, our folks at Green and Spiegel for working with us. Um, I'll go ahead and give some background on our attorney that is joining us tonight, Mr. Jonathan Groge. He graduated um, in 2008 from Temple University Beasley School of Law, magna cum laude. Jonathan serves as a U.S. practice director and managing partner for the firm and has worked continuously in the U.S. business immigration law field since 1999. He has amassed considerable experience obtaining non-immigrant and immigrant visas for new company startups, professional workers, artists and, and entertainers, athletes, physicians, and scientific researchers. Again, I'd just like to welcome um, everyone who's joining us tonight and thank you all for being here. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and kick it over to Jonathan if you'd like to get started with our questions. Yeah, um, so it's great to be here. I, I'm always happy to be here with you guys. Um, and really, you know, with such a small group attending tonight, I, I really want to encourage you to just ask questions. Really, like, feel free to ask and let me know what's on your mind and, and what what sort of uh, things are, you know, troubling you. Immigration is a ever-changing and uh, right now logistically difficult field to deal with, so... Um, but I, I do have your questions here, and I'm just trying to get it to open. Okay. The first question is, I'm graduating in this May, and my F1 expires in June, July. I'm going to graduate school in August. If somehow I don't go back to my home country during the summer to renew my visa, will I be able to transfer my I-20 over to go to grad school? Um, great question, and in all honesty, this is one you want to point to your student um, <clears throat> and scholar services office at the new school where you're going. They will be able to address this for you. Um, but typically speaking, it's very easy to run CBIS records consecutively when you're going from undergraduate to graduate. Um, so that kind of addresses that question. I don't know if you have any follow-ups. The second question they received was for um, recent graduate students majoring in STEM, how long does the process to obtain a green card and what are the requirements? So that is actually like a very um, uh, that is a very interesting question. And the reason why it's so fascinating is that um, I am very popular this evening. Apparently my phone keeps ringing. The reason why it's such an interesting question is that there was a recent memo that came out, like we're talking like two or three weeks ago, that ostensibly said the national interest waiver category for getting permanent residency, there'll be like a, a more or less like a prima facie case which means like uh, speaks for itself and good evidence that you're eligible for national interest if you have a PhD or higher in a STEM field. Now, as far as the process to obtain a green card, there's so many factors that uh, are at play and I would encourage you to get an individual consultation on that front. It has a lot to do with your nationality, where you're from, um, and they go by where you're born. For example, Indian nationals and Chinese nationals have a much longer wait time than other nationalities. Um, if you are able to qualify for like this STEM provision I was just discussing, that's actually like a self-sponsoring mechanism for permanent residency. So, you know, to put it in perspective, when I teach green cards to my, my class at the law school where I adjunct, 
you know, we spent a good six weeks just talking about the different ways to get permanent residency. So I would say things are really looking up for STEM graduates, which is super encouraging. I have a sneaking suspicion that it's almost going to be ubiquitous at some point with obtaining a degree, a PhD in a STEM field and being able to quickly obtain permanent residency. But um, I would need to know more about your specific situation. Um, okay, you're an in. Next question is, I'm an international student and my partner's from the United States. We will marry. Well, mazel tov to you. Congratulations. How can you legally stay in the United States? Um, well, there's something called an immediate relative petition, and that's for spouses, where you can apply for a green card. And the process is, is you submit an application, a petition, excuse me, on form I-130 to evidence the validity of the relationship, Form I-130, along with an application on Form I-45. There's some ancillary forms that you need, but essentially you're putting together documentation to show that it's a valid marriage, that you cohabitate, that you have a life together. And then right now they're processing them really, really fast. Like the Biden administration has put a super high emphasis on getting marriage-based cases through as quickly as possible. So the processing times have actually gotten tremendously uh, more advantageous. And, and in a lot of cases, you can get it done start to finish in less than six months. The next question just, question just says, U.S. visa administrative processing. Well, administrative processing is a tricky thing. Um, sometimes it's because you have a name that is similar to somebody that's on like a terrorist watch list. Sometimes it's because they have questions about like uh, the, uh, you know, your degree and, and um, how, you know, it's applicable for the program that you're taking. Um, and sometimes it's like places that you visited, like if you've been in Iran or Afghanistan, they can give you a hard time there. Usually administrative processing is quite quick. But again, like that immigrant visa question, they're really, really tough in so much as each individual case kind of takes on a life of its own and requires individual analysis. Um, next question is a good one. Can I apply to both green card and H-1B if my company only sponsors H-1B at first? What precautions should I be aware of while in OPT? Um, typically speaking, the way it works is you want to get that H-1B first, get yourself into a dual intent visa, a visa that you, know, you have the intent to remain permanently or temporarily. From there, you can go through the process of permanent residency through employer-based sponsorship. Um, now, this question is a little bit challenging because it says my company only sponsors H1B. It's very hard unless you, you are of an ilk where you have a lot of qualifications and a, a lot of accomplishments that would allow you to self-sponsor for permanent residency. And only the EB1A for extraordinary ability and that national interest waiver one that we were talking about earlier allow for self-sponsorship. So, you know, if your company is not willing to do it, there's not a lot to, to do that, unfortunately. Next question is, can I change from J-1 student to B-2 visa? Is it possible to apply for ESTA while still on a J-1 in America? ESTA is not really something you apply for. You would actually want to submit an application on form I-539 to change to B2 status. So that part's correct. That would allow you to remain as a visitor in the United States. ESTA is really just a travel document to allow you to come in if you're from a country that doesn't require a visa. But if you're running out of J1 time and you wanna stick around for a little bit, changing your status to a visitor is quite common. It happens often. Uh, the next question is, is I plan to find a job in academia, professor, postdoc, awesome. What are the options to get a green card, EB1B or national interest waiver? What needs to be done to have a better chance? Where should I start the application process? So again, this is one of those questions where you really do wanna take a look at your individual record to see what's possible. Um, a lot of postdocs will be forced into doing the national interest waiver. Um, you know, that's quite common. Um, uh, national interest waiver is good because it doesn't require an offer of full-time employment. EB1B is for outstanding researcher and professor. And if you find yourself in a tenure track gig, that's like a no brainer. It's a relatively low threshold. It's much easier than EB1A. 
it does require employer sponsorship. Um, again, you know, to, to assess like what needs to be done to have a better chance, we, we are providing free one-on-one -on -one consultations with Purdue students. So I would certainly avail yourself of that to really dial in on your individual credentials. Um, but yeah, congratulations. Definitely see about an O1 or an H1B in the interim. And then um, you can go from there. Uh, we received a couple of questions on the message boards here. One says I'm graduating in December, 2021 or I graduated in December 21. I applied for an EAD with a start date of February 18th. However, the EAD has a start date of February 28th. I'm in the final stages of obtaining employment. I was curious when is the last date I can start employment without violating the 90 day rule. So it is the EAD date that controls. That is the date when you became eligible to work. You have 90 days to find employment from that date. If you want to be um, more sure about that, you know, questions about F1 status and EADs really should be directed to your Office of um, International Scholars. So I would certainly um, look at that, um, but it would be the date of February 28th in this case. Uh, another question I have is, um, I had a question about royalty income. Ah, I love this. I had created some designs in my home country in India that accrued some income. I withdrew it in the United States. I was wondering if this affects my visa status in any way. So that the answer would be no. Um, and earning dividend income off of a property, off of stocks, that is not a violation of status. Because the ultimate work related to the art was produced outside of the United States, it was, it, there's no issue of working without authorization. So in this case, yes, you can take that dividend income. If you were to do something similar, but be physically present in the United States to create the art, that's where people start to run into problems with working without authorization. Great question. And this one, I think passive income is okay. Um, there's another question that says, I'm an F2 dependent currently in the United States. I changed the status a while ago from F1 to F2 in the US and thus I don't have a valid visa right now. I'll become a student again in the fall. Given the situation, it's difficult to go back to my hunch country. Can you uh, get an F1 visa in a third country where I have no record of living? Yes, you can do that. Um, it's really challenging to do third country national cases right now. There's only a few places that would accept them. Mexico probably would accept a student application in that because of you know, nationality and visa concerns associated with going to Canada, that might be your better bet. You can also file internally again to change to F1 status without the need to actually leave, depart, get a visa and come back into the country. So you have a little bit of optionality there. Oh, these are great questions are rolling in. Uh, all right. I am an international student. This is my first semester in, in the United States. So I'm not eligible for an intern this summer, but I got to know my program coordinator that I'm eligible to do a co-op. So I just want to know if it's mandatory for the co-op to be full-time or can it be part-time? Also, is there any documents specific to these rules and regulations? Um, this is another one of those questions because you are a student where you're best off speaking to your international student and scholars office. Um, they would be in the best position to guide you on this. You probably, if you do do that co-op, want to get something called CPT. CPT is for curricular practical training. You can do that part-time. It doesn't need to be full-time. But this is one of those that this is one of those ones where you're better off taking advantage of the great resources you have at Purdue. You're one of the best international scholars offices in the country, frankly. And I think that this would really be helpful. Um, next question. Great questions coming in. I'm in a STEM field, but my CIP code is not what US considers a STEM. I read before that STEM designation is up to the officer's discretion, if not in the CHIP SEM. But a recent presentation by USAS made, made mention it must be on the CIP STEM list. Yeah, it has to be on the STEM list. I mean, there's no way around that. Um, 
how a particular major is coded and, and that kind of stuff again goes to your international student scholars office and also your department where you're working. So I would take a good look at that again. Um, the next question is, is it possible to start an EB1A and EB2 NIW at the same time? Yes, yes it is. And that's one of the beautiful things about the green card process and I-140 petitions in general. You, unlike non-immigrant status, you can go ahead and um, go ahead and, and do that. You can have multiple I-140s in, and in some instances, we actually recommend that so you can hedge your bets a little bit, but that is completely permissible. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, we have clients that do that all the time. I mean, in all honesty, EB1A and EB2 and IW, they're somewhat similar in terms of the evidence we like to gather and the way we present the case. So this is not that uncommon or unexpected, and um, it is it is common practice. A lot of times, to be honest with you, people will shy away from that because if you're using a law firm to help, it can get pretty expensive. But in terms of feasibility, it is totally feasible. Um, okay, next question. Can I stay in the US and obtain a driver's license with an expired visa with a valid OPT? Uh, and that's a little bit state specific in terms of jurisdiction, but yes, you can do that. Uh, the OPT is ostensibly what actually a lot of DMVs rely on more so than they do on a visa. So I would say that that's fine. Um, okay, next question. And this is actually our last one. Let me see here. Okay. Um, my partner has a valid OPT, which started in January and just got through the H-1B lottery. Congratulations. Her company is continuing with the rest of the process. Would travel sometime in July or August be advisable? I've heard travel is not advisable, but the company HR and their attorney is saying that as she will have the FF1 until our H-1B takes effect, she should be fine to travel as long as returning to Beach October 1st. Um, no, I mean, yes, you can travel and come back in, but the problem is, is if you leave the United States, you sever your continuous presence. And by severing your continuous presence, it means that the, the H-1B will still be approved, but in order to activate it, you need to leave the United States, obtain a new visa stamp, and then come back into the country. So it's not something that I would recommend in this particular instance. Next question. My spouse has an H-1B visa. If I become his dependent, am I eligible to work? In most instances, no. H-4 status, which is the derivative of H-1B, does not carry employment authorization, unlike and unfortunately like some other visa classifications. So that really wouldn't help you work there are situations where you can get an employment authorization, but it requires the principal to have an approved immigrant visa petition, I-140, and um, be subject to backlogs as a result of uh, the numerical the numerical limitations. So um, that one is not really typically seen as a path to being able to work. Uh, the next question is, if I get OPT but won't be able to get a job within 90 days, is it allowed to apply for the H-1B dependent visa immediately? I don't really understand the question because, unfortunately, the H-1B, if it's a private employer, uh, as opposed to like a teaching hospital or a university, you're subject to the numerical limitations of the annual H-1B cap, and you can't just like go into it right away. So, you know, and the other issue is, and, and this is the reality, um, you know, you, you need an employer to sponsor you for an H-1B. Now, if the question is actually saying, okay, um, what I mean is, can I get on my spouse's H-1B? The answer is yes. If I get OPT, but F-1 is expired, does that mean that I won't be able to re-enter? Yes, yes. The OPT does not act as a visa. You need the actual visa stamp in your passport. And then the question is, I will be a resident in July. I'm, a, I'm assuming 
tax resident or a permanent resident because of a green card, can I re request the tax return extensions and then do my tax return after I become a resident? Ooh, I don't really deal with tax stuff. So I don't know the answer to that one, unfortunately. I would, I would advise you to contact an accountant. Um, but yeah, those were our questions for today. Who won the election? Um, Andrew Jensen and Izzy Weber. Whoa, congratulations. You know them? Yeah, yeah. One's in, one's in PSG already in our cabinet. Oh, so you were pulling with them. Okay. Well, that's exciting. Um, we got through all the questions. We can continue with open forum. Uh, I really do encourage you guys to take advantage of the availability of you know these free consultations for your individual situations. I think that that can be extremely beneficial. Um, certainly to have dedicated guidance about your specific situation is necessary. As you could see when I was talking about the green card, it's not like readily apparent like what path or options you're talking about. Um, Again, I really do want to highlight the importance of using your International Student and Scholars Office. Uh, you have a tremendous resource available to you at Purdue. Um, you know, you just need to know the right types of questions to ask. So, cool. Awesome. So how do you Thank feel? How do you feel about stepping down? How was your tenure? 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 Uh, 